I'm Jerry Bradley of the Notre Dame Law School. It's my pleasure to introduce our speakers today and to moderate uh, their presentations and your questions and their answers. And it seems to me that there is no more appropriate topic, maybe even no more important topic, in a conference devoted to the theme of justice than the question of criminal punishment, crime and punishment, because I think in no other way or in no other context does political authority acting in the name of the entire community identify persons individually and proceed to impose upon those persons great privations, starting down with uh, modest conditions upon their liberty to fines, to prolonged periods of confinement, and even in a limit case, to execution. So I think that the way crime and punishment works and the question about the moral justification of punishment is essential to any satisfying account of justice. And it's on that long list of topics and issues that was not talked about during the recent presidential election. Joblessness and uh, deficits crowded this one out as well. And it's not that the presidential election is a time for a national seminar on the moral philosophy of punishment. But nonetheless, there are pressing practical issues that intersect with our discussion today. There are parts of the country where lawlessness is still perhaps the great issue involving crime and punishment, but those are mostly local questions. But as a national community, I think two things come to my mind as pressing and even urgent matters involving crime and punishment. One is what's usually called overcriminalization. That's a reference to the numerical exponential growth in the number of federal crimes, but also to the nature of those crimes, mostly regulatory offenses, in which behavior that's morally innocuous is made criminal in the name of regulation. And indeed, it's behavior which seems to at times involve no conscious choice on the part of a person who could be held strictly liable for that criminal offense. So it seems like we're punishing some people without any fault. And the other, of course, is that we punish too many people. I think one of the remarkable things that's emerging is uh, into a consensus, if you will, among commentators, lawyers, prosecutors, defense lawyers alike, uh, is that we are putting too many people in prison for too long. So we have a prison population that I think is double the nearest competitor in the so-called developed world. So those two issues, I think, are pressing matters. I don't know that any of our speakers today will shed direct light on answers to those questions, but certainly what they say will enrich our understanding of the problem and contribute to answering those questions. So our topic today is crime, justice, punishment, and mercy. Uh, we have three excellent speakers. Uh, I myself think it's especially appropriate that um, Dostoevsky is represented on this panel, as well as St. John's College from Annapolis, Maryland. Uh, but our first speaker today will be Christopher Slobogan, who's a law professor at Vanderbilt Law School, and is surely among the top handful of criminal law scholars in America, at least in American law schools, and I think is, is widely known and deservedly known as someone who brings an acute philosophical analytical mind to questions of crime and punishment. He'll be our first speaker. And then we have two speakers to follow, both of whom will address uh, themes or, or matters uh, related to Dostoevsky's publications. The first will be Nick Mastrellis, a tutor at St. John's College, who received his B.S. degree from Bates College and is a teaching assistant, was a teaching assistant, a university fellow in the department, actually, of the history of science at the University of Wisconsin. And Chester Burke will be our final third speaker. He's also a tutor at St. John's College who received his BA from St. John's and a master, master's degree in music from the University of Michigan. Now, lest you be concerned about the qualifications of these last two speakers, I mean, some of you may not realize that at St. John's College in Annapolis, um, a tutor is someone who teaches and instructs, but they are required to be, I don't know if they have, ambidextrous is not quite the term, but multidisciplinary. Uh, at St. John's College is famously committed to not only well-rounded students, you say, but you might say well-rounded teachers. So if I understand correctly, that no matter what your particular disciplinary background, whether it's music or science, as the case may be, or the history of science, everyone at St. John's within a space of six years or so teaches throughout the curriculum. So the, our speakers today, I don't know if expert's the right term, would be well-versed not only in Dostoevsky, but in Euclid's geometry, the history of science, and I would assume the formation of the Constitution. So uh, it's a particular treat, perhaps, to have such uh, breadth of learning brought to bear upon what, for specialists like myself and Professor Slobogan, for that matter, 
um, it becomes a kind of parochial issue where we talk to the same set of law professors uh, about the problems of crime and punishment. I think it will be especially benefited and welcome their contributions. So without further ado, uh, Professor Slobogin. Well, thank, thanks very much, Craig. Um, I won't be talking about the issues to which Craig alluded to, but I'd love to talk about them during question and answer if we've got some time. I also won't not be talking about Dostoevsky. Um, I will be talking about crime and punishment, though, at least in a general sense. And more specifically, like everyone else at this conference, I'm going to be talking about justice, and specifically what justice means in the criminal law context. And even more specifically still, as the title suggests, I'm going to be talking about a very interesting issue having to do with to what extent lay views ought to be relevant to figuring out what justice means in the criminal justice context. I think it's a very important issue to grapple with. Um, now, usually when we talk about justice in the criminal justice context, we take a deontological approach, which, as you all know, focuses on first principles and is designed to get at universal moral rules that might help us figure out what punishment should be. And the usual outcome of that kind of analysis is retributivism. The idea that punishment ought to be commensurate with the culpability or blameworthiness of the offender. And that idea is often associated with Immanuel Kant, among other people. And the way we implement that idea is through the notion of desert. We figure out what a person deserves for their crime, usually by looking at the harm caused by the crime and the mental state of the offender at the time of the crime. If it's malicious or something short of malicious, that helps us decide how blameworthy an individual is. Combine all of that kind of analysis together, and we get what we consider to be just retributive punishment. Um, there is a competing ideology, a competing approach to punishment, often called utilitarianism, um, associated with Jeremy Bentham. And here, the idea is not to look backward at the time of the offense, what the offense was, what the blameworthiness of the offender was, but rather to look forward figure out how we can prevent crime from occurring in the future through implementing general deterrence, specific deterrence ideas by implementing uh, the idea of incapacitation of dangerous effect, offenders and by rehabilitating people who could benefit from treatment and, and thus and th and that, in that way reduce recidivism. So that is a utilitarian approach. The basic idea is based on empirical research and experience to figure out whether a particular punishment will prevent crime either in society as a whole or with respect to an individual offender, all without unduly chilling innocent behavior or confining non-dangerous people. So the utilitarian approach can result in very different outcomes than the retributive approach. So take, for instance, uh, an offender who commits a minor offense, but who is considered to be dangerous. A retributivist will probably give very minimal punishment to that individual because the crime is minimal. On the other hand, a utilitarian might be willing to intervene fairly extensively in this case because the individual is dangerous. In order to prevent crime, we need to intervene in a more serious manner. Uh, in contrast, assume we have a serious offender who is not dangerous. Retributivist is going to impose harsh punishment on that individual because the individual is blameworthy, given the harm caused, whereas the utilitarian might actually intervene only in a minimal fashion because the person isn't considered very dangerous. We don't need to incapacitate the person to protect society. So there can be very different results depending upon which approach you take. The question I'm going to be talking about to a large extent this morning is, is the second approach justice? Most deontological retributivists would say no, that utilitarianism has nothing to do with justice. It might have a lot to do with cost-benefit analysis, but it has nothing to do with justice. And in fact, I think even utilitarians would admit that their approach doesn't have much to do with justice as typically construed. Uh, they might say it has something to do with preventive justice, which is sort of a way of finessing the whole idea of justice, but they probably would admit that they, don't, uh, they aren't trying to achieve justice as that phrase is typically defined. The bottom line is that utilitarian approaches are seen as either agnostic about or directly hostile to concepts of justice as traditionally defined by retributivism. Enter Paul Robinson, who's a law professor at the University of Pennsylvania Law Review, excuse me, law school. He's also with the Law Review. But he argues that retributivism and utilitarianism can be reconciled, can be reconciled through what he calls empirical desert. What does he mean by empirical desert? We try to figure out what society thinks 
what the general public thinks is deserved punishment with respect to various kinds of crimes. And then we fashion our criminal justice system around what society thinks is deserved punishment. Okay? The reason he calls it empirical desert is we find out about desert not through deontological reasoning, not through philosophizing, but rather through empirically investigating what society thinks about desert. And then we fashion our criminal punishment around what society thinks. He claims this approach can satisfy both retributivists and people who follow the utilitarian approach. Now, how so? Uh, well, he says, what society thinks about justice is probably going to be pretty similar to what philosophers think. Now, those of you in the room who are philosophers may object to that, but that's what he says. Okay, that most of the time, what society thinks is just is going to conform with what philosophers think. Now, there are a lot of methodological problems, even if you believe that basic premise, there are a lot of problems with figuring out what society thinks. First of all, how can we reliably ascertain societal views? You all know how difficult it is to conduct polls and surveys. The recent election demonstrates how difficult it is to be right about these things. And in addition, when asking about criminal issues, it's very hard to get within a poll or a survey the nuances that are often associated with crime. But even if we can reliably figure out societal views, what do we do with the data that we get? Um, do we say desert is whatever the average respondent says is just? Even if, for instance, the average respond respondent is a white male as opposed to an African American or Hispanic? So that presents, I think, a problem with trying to operationalize desert empirically. And then, of course, sometimes we might not get an average view. In other words, results may be so disparate that we don't really have a central tendency in terms of what people think is justice. Uh, and here's why I'm doing PowerPoint. To show you this slide, if you can't see it, then my PowerPoint has gone off or not. But what this represents is people's reaction to 12 different crimes, which are in the left-hand column, specifically how much punishment they would impose for these kinds of crimes, ranging from theft of a pie in the top left all the way down to rape and killing of a child. And what I want you to look at are the second and third columns. The second column gives you the standard deviation in terms of how people, uh, the, the punishment that people impose for these various kinds of crimes. And any of you who know statistics know that a standard deviation of over two is relatively unusual. There's no standard deviation under three in the second column. So a whole bunch of scatter here in terms of what people think is the appropriate punishment. If this was represented in terms of histograms, um, basically what this would look like is a mouth with a lot of missing and chipped teeth. Okay, there's a lot of disagreement. If you look at the third column, which gives you the range of punishment imposed within two standard deviations, what this does is it removes all the outliers, all the irrational outliers. You have incredible ranges in that second column. Even for theft of a pie, some people said no liability at all. Other people said four years. Go down to rape and death of a child, 15 years to the death penalty. So you get incredible variation. What are we supposed to do with those kinds of results when we're trying to figure out what society's views of desert are? Even if we can accomplish that goal, of course, there's the problem of figuring out whether we should pay any attention to the average view if it's repugnant to us. Probably if we polled a majority of the country, at least a majority of certain portions of this country, people would be in favor of torture for certain kinds of crimes. What do we do with that fact? Should philosophy trump the majority rule? That's another problem with empirical desert. So those are some of the problems. We could talk for an hour just about this stuff, but I'm going to stop there because I actually want to focus on something else. I'm going to take as a given that empirical desert can be the default position. Yes, yeah, sometimes we'll run into the problems we just talked about, but let's assume we can get good empirical information, giving us what the average take is on desert. And then also, let's assume that a lot of times philosophers don't agree on things, right? So if there's a disagreement among philosophers, what should the default position be? What society thinks on average, OK? That would be the approach I think Robinson would want to take with respect to empirical desert. Empirical desert is the default position. What I think is more interesting is what empirical desert has to say to utilitarians. Because you think empirical desert would be directly contrary to what utilitarians would want to do, right? But Robinson says otherwise. He says that actually we can achieve utilitarian goals best by adhering to societal views on desert. How does he arrive at that conclusion? Based on a work of Tom Tyler and others, Tom Tyler has written quite famously about why people obey the law. What Tom Tyler has said is that there's a very close relationship between respect for authority and compliance with the law. Robinson takes that idea and runs with it in his empirical desert work. He says people are much more likely to respect the law if the law adheres to their views of what's deserved, if the law adheres to desert as empirically derived through public opinion polls. If the law adheres to that idea of desert, there's much more likely to be compliance. 
So in other words, what Robinson is arguing is that dessert has great utility. Following dessert actually can be the most effective way of preventing crime from a utilitarian perspective. Very interesting idea. I don't buy any of it. Okay, I'm very skeptical of all of this. Um, let me tell you why and break it down, what, what empirical desserts all about into three different hypotheses. The first hypothesis is the consensus hypothesis, that there is agreement in society about the punishment that's deserved for core crimes. Maybe not for other crimes, but for core crimes like murder, rape, robbery, burglary, there is agreement about the ranking of those crimes and the kind of punishment that ought to be imposed. Um, and there is, in fact, research that suggests that, at least in terms of rankings, um, there is a lot of consensus, cross-culturally, not just within the United States. Um, compliance hypothesis is, to the extent criminal punishment diverges from the societal consensus, there be, there'll be an increase in non-compliance with the law, based on Tyler's kind of assumptions, that uh, there'll be disrespect for the law, and that will create non-compliance. And finally, Robinson suggests, this is the crime control hypothesis, that the degree of non-compliance created by diverging from societal views of dessert will be equal to or even greater than the non-compliance that result if we ignore preventive goals. Put another way, maybe in a bit more understandable fashion, what Robinson's arguing is if we follow dessert, empirically derived dessert, will be at least as good at preventing crime as if we try to directly implement utilitarian goals of deterrence, rehabilitation, and incapacitation. So a very interesting set of ideas. As I said, I was skeptical about it, so I got together with a postdoc at Vanderbilt, and we conducted a number of studies. I want to tell you about three of them if I have time. I'm not sure I will. But if I have time, with an idea of figuring out the extent to which lay views are relevant to justice, which is what this conference is all about. So um, in terms of evaluating the consensus hypothesis, we gave 530 subjects 12 scenarios uh, depicting 12 different crimes. It happens to be the same 12 crimes you saw in that chart I showed you earlier, from theft of a pie down to uh, rape and death of a child. Um, the control group received these 12 scenarios in six pairs. So the 12 scenarios were divided into six pairs, and the control group was told that they should tell us which crime within each pair should receive the most punishment. Just simply rank each pair, which should get the most punishment, which should get the least punishment. Experimental group was given exactly the same scenarios in the same six pairs, but with one change. One crime within each pair was modified to include utilitarian factors having to do with risk, dangerousness, or treatability. So for instance, one scenario was changed to add the fact that the defendant had a prior criminal record. Another scenario was changed to add the fact that after the individual committed the crime, he sought out anger management therapy. And a third offense was changed to include the fact that after the person committed the crime, he told his friends he wanted to do it again. So that's integrating utilitarian kinds of factors into uh, the scenario. And what we hypothesized is that the experimental group would come up with different rankings in the control group because of the integration of the utilitarian factors. And that's, in fact, what we found. First, though, I want to point out, within each group, there was a lot of consensus. So Robbins is right about that. People do agree on the ordinal rankings of crimes. The control group was very consistent in terms of the rankings. The experimental group was very consistent in terms of its rankings. The difference was between the two groups. The experimental group reversed the rankings in three of the six scenarios, and in two of the other three came very close to reversing the rankings. So the bottom line here is that when utilitarian factors are added into the mix, people come up with different rankings. And I think this, this finding calls into question the notion that justice is just about retribution. Um, if people are willing to rank criminal scenarios differently depending upon factors having nothing to do with dessert, are they being unjust, or are they just defining justice in a different way? As an aside, I'll mention, and this goes back to the chart I showed you, that even though there was consensus in terms of rankings, there was no consensus in terms of the punishment that should be imposed with respect to each of these 12 scenarios. Within both the control and experimental groups, the standard deviations were huge. There was no agreement about punishment, the precise punishment that should be imposed. But there was agreement about the rankings. The point I really want to focus on with respect to study one is that the rankings changed when people were given utilitarian factors. Now, what does that say about the definition of justice? Should it be only retributive in nature? Another way of getting that is at that issue is by figuring out how people react to punishment that they don't like. When they hear about a punishment they don't like, how do they react to it? That gets to the compliance hypothesis. Remember, the compliance hypothesis is that when the law diverges from what people think is just, then they're more likely to be non-compliant. Well, we investigated that, that hypothesis as well. Same 530 subjects. We asked them what they thought the law was in their jurisdiction and what they thought it should be. More specifically, we asked them what they thought the maximum sentence was for 17 specific crimes. And then 
We asked them what they thought the law should be. Well, a lot of people answered that question basically the same, both of those questions the same way. In other words, they agreed with the law in their jurisdiction. But a lot of people did not like the law in their jurisdiction. According to compliance theory, that second group of people who do not like the law in their jurisdiction should be less compliant with the law, right? They're dissatisfied with the law, so they should be less compliant with it. That's Robinson's theory. That's what the compliance hypothesis is all about. We hypothesized, on the other hand, we wouldn't find any relationship between compliance and dissatisfaction with the law. How do you measure compliance? Well, it's hard to do, but Janice Nadler at Northwestern has developed a compliance measure which asks people how likely it is they are going to commit eight different crimes. Now, since it's anonymous, hopefully they answer honestly. These are relatively minor crimes like parking violations, speeding, stealing music off the internet. Anybody ever done any of that stuff? So the question is, how likely are you to commit these kinds of crimes? What we did is we got the compliance tendencies from that measure, and we compared that with people's level of dissatisfaction. And again, we thought there wouldn't be much of a relationship. We were wrong. There was a relationship. For the control group in study one, we found a correlation of 0.1 between dissatisfaction with the law and noncompliance. And for the experimental group in study one, we found a correlation of 0.22 between dissatisfaction and noncompliance. Those aren't huge correlations, but they're nothing to sneeze at either. The problem was, for this study, the prompts for the experimental control groups were exactly the same. We asked all 530 subjects what they thought the maximum sentence was for these 17 crimes and what they thought the law should be. So there shouldn't have been any difference between these two groups. But then we realized the experimental group had in study one read those six scenarios that included risk and treatability factors. And so what we thought maybe was going on was that having those kinds of scenarios in mind, the experimental group became more dissatisfied with the law because they realized fixed determinate sentences based on retributive options are not flexible enough to take into account individualized dangerousness and treatability issues. And if that's true, our, 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 it looks like there's more likely to be noncompliance when the law diverges from utilitarian considerations as opposed to desert considerations, given this data down here. Does that mean th somehow that uh, justice is being offended if people feel that utilitarian considerations are more important? If people are more irritated by failure to follow utilitarian considerations, um, shouldn't that be relevant to justice considerations? The final study, which I only have two minutes to deal with, um, gets at more directly the extent to which people are willing to abandon dessert in favor of utilitarian factors. So what we did is we asked 530 subjects to look at six different scenarios, totally different scenarios, and we told the control group what the offenses were and a little bit about the personal history of the offender. The experimental group got exactly the same six scenarios, but in addition they got information about innovative treatment programs that might reduce recidivism. Okay? And we expected that the experimental group would reduce punishment because of the treatment information. In fact, that's what we found. With five of the six scenarios, all involving mid-level felonies, the experimental group reduced punishment by 30 to 60 percent, once again showing the utilitarian factors heavily influence what people think about punishment. Now, it is true with respect to one scenario, the homicide scenario, the most serious scenario we gave people, 60 percent of the experimental group was unwilling to budge. They did not reduce punishment at all, despite the innovative treatment information. On the other hand, the 40 percent who did budge we're willing to reduce punishment on average 40%. But, but that second finding suggests that when it's a serious crime, people don't abandon dessert. Okay, dessert is the principal driver. On the other hand, when it's not such a serious crime, dessert doesn't necessarily play any role, only a very minimal role in terms of the kind of punishment that people are willing to impose. So that gets me to my last slide. I just want to ask a series of questions. Should justice be defined entirely by retributive considerations, as most philosophers think should be the case? Um, or rather, should utilitarian factors be taken into account in figuring out what justice is? It certainly seems that lay people think about utilitarian factors. And just to conceptualize a little bit more, is it just to detain a non-dangerous person simply because he has not served his time? Okay, that's a kind of question utilitarian would ask in justice terms. Another kind of justice question utilitarian would ask, is it just to the dangerous prisoner or a subsequent victim to release him because he has completed the time he deserves? So if you think lay views ought to be relevant to criminal punishment, as Robinson does, and if our results are replicated, um, you might say yes, excuse me, you might say no to all those questions. Even though retributives would probably say yes to all those questions, the utilitarian would probably say no to all those questions. So the bottom line question is, are lay views relevant to punishment? Or put another way, and I think sort of cleverly, is justice just us? Or should it be something different? Thank you very much.
Well, thank you very much. I do think that the presentation, although a little number intensive for my taste, uh, nonetheless raises these questions, I think, are questions that should be part of any serious philosophical discussion of crime and punishment. And indeed, I think that a, a satisfying normative account of punishment would have to take into account um, what it is that people think about punishment, or put it differently, how people value or evaluate the harm caused by particular crimes. So I think there is a possibility of synthesizing, you might say, the lay view with the philosopher's normative view. Now for something I, I trust, I, I, I'm not going to be proved wrong about this, there's something for completely different uh, tastes. I think that uh, the next two papers will probably introduce, in a way that Professor Slobogan did not, uh, the question of mercy. There may be elements or facets of mercy manifest in some of the humanitarian impulses manifest in the data about lessening punishment where there are reform-oriented programs available, but the term mercy, or concept at least, did not appear to be part of this investigation of our topic, but I trust it will make its appearance as we move to Dostoevsky. And first, uh, Nicholas Marfel Marfel Salas is going to talk about Raskolnikov's redemption, uh, which leads me to think it has something to do with mercy. Thank you. Good morning. Um, let me get one thing out of the way first. Can everybody hear me? Yeah, wonderful. I have a very soft voice. Um, the narrative of time and punishment is very straightforward. Uh, an impoverished university student named Raskolnikov plans and commits a murder. The murder accidentally turns into a double murder. There follows a sequence of incidents and conversations in which the turmoil this act causes in the soul of the criminal is revealed. Through two conversations with a young prostitute named Sonia, the murderer finally confesses his crime. First to her and then to the authorities. Finally, there's an epilogue in which we are told that he is sentenced to a period of imprisonment in Siberia. Sonia follows him to Siberia. Remarkable things happen to him there. Of all the four great novels of Dostoevsky, Crime and Punishment, The Idiot, Demons, and The Brothers Karamazov, this is the only one in which Dostoevsky engages in a sustained dialectic with the interior life of one and only one character. Crime, on the other hand, is a theme in all of them, but it's only in this work that Dostoevsky engages single-mindedly in an unfolding of the nature of crime, its causes in the human soul, and its effects there. This makes it particularly relevant to the themes of this conference. However, Dostoevsky is not as interested in criminal justice as he is in the effects of crime, first on the soul of the criminal and finally on the whole human community. This doesn't mean that he ignores justice. In fact, the question of Raskolnikov's death to, debt to society occupies a large part of the book, especially in the interrogation of Raskolnikov by Porfiry Petrovich, the investigating detective who suspects very early that Raskolnikov is the murderer, and especially in the conversations with Sonia. It does mean that considerations of justice are a dialectical moment in the unfolding of crime and not the highest moment. By dialectical moment, I mean that the claims of justice are gathered up and form part of the transformation of the redeemed criminal. There, um, the claims of justice could be said to be satisfied when the criminal is punished, but Dostoevsky is not interested in punishment as retribution. He thinks it's ineffective. He is interested in punishment only insofar as the demand for it arises in the criminal, criminal himself and results in his redemption. The highest moment is when the criminal acknowledges his crime and asks for forgiveness from the whole human community. Thus, Dostoevsky's treatment is psychological if it is clear that by psychology one does not mean a putative science of the soul but an attempt to get to know another human being. In the notebooks on crime and punishment, Dostoevsky makes the extraordinary claim that it is the crime itself which makes Raskolnikov a moral being. He, and I quote from the notebooks, he says, his moral development begins from the crime itself. The possibility of such questions arises which would not have existed previously. It's impossible in a short paper to do more than give us a sketch of this theme, and even this sketch will focus on only a few incidents.
uh, I come now to Dostoevsky's account of crime. The commission of a crime for him is a sign that the criminal has separated himself from his fellow human beings. It's not the crime which separates the criminal, but some transformation in his soul which causes him to focus his attention entirely on himself. Such transformations are hard to discern. Often even those closest to the criminal are puzzled about what's going on. Even the criminal himself is not fully aware of what is moving him. He becomes surprised at his own behavior. I think this is the reason why Dostoevsky thinks that ordinary punishment is useless in reforming the criminal. Since the criminal has consciously separated himself from society, he believes that the power of society is arbitrary and that the freedom he has given himself precisely by his separation from his fellows makes that retribution merely another act of violence equivalent to his own. He resents and despises the power of society. Redemption cannot come from actions done to the criminal, but it has to arise in his own soul. The murder is committed at the end of part one of the novel. Uh, part one takes place over three days and the whole novel over two weeks. In the days leading up to the crime, Raskolnikov has stopped going out. He has stopped seeing his friend uh, Razumikin and has stopped communicating with his mother and sister. He has also stopped tutoring students. He has no income. He hasn't paid his rent for a long time. He spends most of his time sleeping in his room, a horrible little garret. He eats only when Natasha, the caretaker, brings him something. He is withdrawing from the world. On the very first page, our narrator tells us that, quote, he was so immersed in himself and had isolated himself so much from everyone that he was afraid not only of meeting his landlady, but of meeting anyone at all, end quote. However, the ambivalence in Raskolnikov's soul is presented to us almost immediately. At the beginning of chapter two of part one, we are told that he, quote, was not used to crowds, but now something suddenly drew him to people. This is the first indication of what I call the doubleness in Raskolnikov's soul. He separates himself from others, but he cannot do it wholeheartedly. Later we learn that it is precisely this doubleness which makes his redemption possible. The sequence of events in part one leading up to the murder, this sequence is very important to Dostoevsky's dialectic, so I will take some time with it. On the first day, he wakes up and goes out and immediately goes to the pawnbroker, Alyona Ivanovna, whom he is planning to murder. He pretends he wants to pawn something. Dostoevsky reveals to us carefully her poisonous, grasping character. This visit is essentially a rehearsal of the murder. So the murder is committed twice in his soul. He assures himself of the rightness of what he is planning by reminding himself of Iona's wickedness. By this he shows the conventional side of his character, which he in turn despises. He then decides that he wants to come in contact with people and enters a tavern where he starts talking with Marmeladov, uh, a civil servant who is also a drunkard and who is deliberately destroying his own and his family's life. Uh, Raskolnikov helps bring him home and he meets his consumptive wife and hungry children. Marmeladov is the father of Sonia, the 14-year-old prostitute with whom he falls in love and who saves him. When he leaves, Raskolnikov leaves behind without saying anything most of his money. Our narrator makes it clear that his own generosity at this moment is unintelligible to him. He returns home and goes to sleep. On the second day, he is given a letter from his, uh, from his mother in which he reads in great detail of their various trials, including the decision by his sister to marry someone despicable so as to escape penury. While he is reading the letter, his face was wet with tears, but when he finishes, quote, it was pale, twisted convulsively, and a heavy, bilious, spiteful smile wandered over his lips. He continues wandering about St. Petersburg and comes across a young woman, a girl who is obviously drunk, whose clothes have been put on her in disarray, obviously by those who have violated her before they sent her out into the street. She is being followed by a middle-aged, well-dressed man whose intentions are obvious. Raskolnikov's first impulse is to help her. He yells at the man and calls a police officer who is nearby to come and help. He gives him some money for a taxi to bring the girl home when they find where she lives. 
our narrator then tells us, at that moment, it was as if something stung Raskolnikov, as if he had been turned about in an instant. And then he says to the police officer, forget it. What do you care? Leave her alone. Let him have his fun. What is it to you? He now identifies with the presumptive violator. He continues walking in this insane pilgrimage through St. Petersburg and finally collapses in complete exhaustion under some bushes, falls asleep. He dreams a terrible dream. He is a boy walking with his father and they witness a peasant beating his horse to death, accompanied by cheers from a crowd. He tries to stop it but cannot. He asks his father why he is doing it. His father tells him that it's none of their business. When he wakes up, he says, thank God it was only a dream. But then he says, God, but can it be, can it be that I will really take an ax and hit her on, her, on the head and smash her skull, slip in the sticky warm blood, break the lock, steal and tremble and hide, all covered with blood with the ax, can it be? He has now identified himself not with the helpless witness of the slaughter, but with both the murderer and the victim, and he is horrified. He continues walking and inadvertently through an overheard conversation uh, and discovers through an overheard conversation that Alyona's sister, Lizaveta, will not be in their apartment at a certain time on that day. On the next day, the third day, he kills Alyona with an axe. Unfortunately, Lizaveta comes home unexpectedly, and he has to kill her too. He hurriedly and inexpertly steals some things, returns to his apartment, and falls asleep. Sleeps for a very long time. Um, the, one, the main thing I want us to notice is that Raskolnikov affirms the crime and yet is horrified by it. He rejects human contact and yet seeks it. He weeps for his mother and sister and is yet filled with spite. He cannot affirm anything in himself wholeheartedly. Dostoevsky has deliberately structured this crime for us. In the first place, he does not make Alyona a sympathetic victim. She is greedy and selfish and looks it. He does not want our con confrontation with the issue of crime to be sentimentalized by feelings of pity for the victim. On the other hand, Lizaveta is a sympathetic character. He murders her purely for the sake of concealment. So the dividedness in Raskolnikov is mirrored in the victims. It's also essential that there's no evidence against them. Through an improbable series of circumstances, and in spite of his own blunders, he escapes undetected from a building filled with people and manages to hide what he stole uh, before he is searched. Dostoevsky has constructed a controlled experiment in which all the variables except for the feelings and reactions of the criminal are controlled. If a skull in the coffin could be found out, it would have to be by some action of his own. We are now ready to consider the crime from Raskolnikov's point of view. He initially gives two reasons for the crime. He needs the money to advance his career. He needs the money to help his mother and sister. He understands both to be humanitarian reasons. He is a very able man, and if he could advance his career, he could do valuable work for mankind. He is a very able man, and if he could advance his career, he could help his mother and sister. Contrasted with this is the fact that Alyona is a horrible person and has not done anything good for anyone. Her death would be a blessing. Underlying these reasons is the idea that for the sake of humanity, higher human beings can transgress ordinary moral and civil laws. In fact, Raskolnikov put forth the idea that this is what great men do all the time. His recurrent example of this is Napoleon. In fact, he had apparently written an essay which was published on this theme. We, the readers, never get to read it. Um, up to this point, Raskolnikov's internal dialectic that he is a that it is that he is a great man like Newton, uh, like Isaac Newton or Napoleon, who seeks to sacrifice ordinary conventions for some higher good. However, the conduct of the crime speaks against them. The theft is botched. He doesn't have time to hide to find the large catch of money in the apartment. The money and jewels that he does steal, he hides, ostensibly because it would be too dangerous to spend it, but it's clear that their presence horrifies him. It reminds him of what he did. He becomes increasingly, it becomes increasingly clear that the reasons for the crime do not come close to revealing what's in his soul or what he thinks is in his soul. This comes out most decisively in the words spoken to Sonia in the second conversation. I will quote them here in full. 
I tormented myself for so many days. Would Napoleon have gone ahead or not? It means I must really have felt clearly that I was not Napoleon. I endured all, all the torment of this battle, Sonia, and I longed to shake it all off my back. I wanted to kill without casualty, to kill for myself, for myself alone. I didn't want to lie about it, even to myself. It was not to help my mother that I killed. Nonsense. I did not kill so that having a quiet means and power, I could become a benefactor of mankind. Nonsense. I simply killed for myself alone. And whether I would later become anyone's benefactor or would spend my life like a spider, catching everyone in my web and sucking the life sap out of them, should at this moment have made no difference to me. And it was not the money above all that I wanted, not the money so much as something else. I know all this now. Understand me, perhaps, continuing on the same path, I would never again repeat the murder. This was something, there was something else I wanted to know, something else nudging my arm. I wanted to find out then and find out quickly whether I was a louse like all the rest or a man. Would I be able to step over or not? Would I dare to reach down and take or not? Am I a trembling creature or do I have the right to kill? Um, I will turn now to the question of what Raskolnikov meant by saying that he committed the crime entirely for himself. Um, the question of freedom was very important to Dostoevsky. It is present in one way or another in all of the four great works. Think, for example, of Nikolai Stavrogin and Demons. It's also important to say that it's not an idea that Dostoevsky dismisses. Um, um, it is freedom that Raskolnikov is seeking. First, he is seeking freedom from the bounds of social conventions and also, and most importantly, from what he considers his own sentimental tendencies. This is why he has to separate himself off from other human beings, why the separation is the source of crime. I do not believe that Dostoevsky is saying that all criminals have motives exactly like those of Raskolnikov, but that some such separation is from mankind is at work in all of them. What he is interested in exploring is what happens when someone tries to do this deliberately. After he commits the murder, Raskolnikov is still torn, but now the stakes are much higher than before. Now he has to see if he has the fortitude to affirm his crime not as a project, but as his own deed. This affirmation would be a sign that he was, in fact, a superior being, a free man, and not an ordinary criminal. However, he decides, he discovers very early that he can't do this. Sentimental regrets plague him. He becomes ill and he experiences an almost overwhelming desire to confess. It is this desire to confess which exposes him to the interest of the police. Um, he, he, he begins to feel regret, um, but he doesn't regret entirely because he realizes that what he has done is wrong. He regrets because he cannot wholeheartedly affirm his crime. Of course, there is a part of him that does regret the crime profoundly, but he knows that knows that he has done a terrible things, but it takes the whole rest of the novel and the epilogue for him to acknowledge this, uh, and to acknowledge that this other part of him is not simply convention. The novel proper ends with Raskolnikov's confession, once to Sonia and once to the police. He speaks with Sonia twice. In the, the first conversation is a rehearsal of the confession. In the second conversation, he actually confesses. This behavior mirrors the commission of the crime. His confession to the police is also double. He goes to the police station to confess. He decides that he can't. He walks out. He sees Sonia standing in the street. He turns around, walks back to the police station, and confesses. The novel ends with a confession which is ambiguous. Is Raskolnikov finally filled with remorse, or is he confessing because he has failed to live up to his own view of the murderer and of himself. In the epilogue, of which there is no hint in the notebooks, we are told that Raskolnikov was sentenced to eight years of hard labor in Siberia. Dostoevsky makes it clear that both spirits in Dostoevsky are still at war with one another. At a certain point, our narrator tells us that Raskolnikov was suffering not only from remorse, but not from remorse, but from wounded pride in, at the fact that he had to confess in order to find peace for himself. 
However, this still does not mean repentance. He did not repent of his crime, our narrator says. I only have uh, a little bit of time now to give a very bare sketch of the transformation that actually happens to him in Siberia. The, most, the first and most fundamental element is his love for Sonia. Um, this love began from the first moment of their meeting, but it's also true that from the first moment of their meeting, it annoys him, and he tries to get rid of it. But it's clear that whether he likes it or not, she is what ties him to life itself. In, Siber in Siberia, she becomes indispensable to him. But another thing happens to him, which is quite extraordinary. He discovers that all his fellow prisoners, all of whom are quite horrible in some way and have lived much harder lives than he has, all love life. Quote, he looked at his fellow convicts and was amazed at how they too all loved life, how they valued it. It, is preci it precisely seemed to him that in prison they loved and valued it even more than in freedom. I believe that it is this experience which was responsible for his transformation. It wasn't punishment as retribution that healed his soul, but the experience of being with desperate men who loved life more than he did. It is this which makes him realize the meaning of the murders he committed. They were acts against life itself, and thus against all human beings. It is this which in some wholly mysterious way allowed him to discover the love of life in himself. I'm going to end now with an example uh, which was about this sort of thing, which was related to me by my friend and colleague Howard Zeidemann in an essay about the educational work he has been doing for the last 15 years with prisoners at a maximum security prison in Jessup, Maryland. I'm quoting now. Once we were considering a drawing as a text. The text was a drawing by Kathe Kowitz, prisoners listening to music. Uh, the three prisoners are skeletal, with hollow eyes, and all seemingly gripped by something. The session was not going very well, and I regretted trying to use a text that connected too vividly with their situation. A number of the younger members were clearly repulsed by the drawing, and when I asked a few why, who often spoke why they were silent, Larry answered, it's scary looking at them. I don't want that to be me. As he finished, another prisoner, Craig, a man almost 70 years old, who first served time more than 50 years before, laughed and said, you don't understand nothing. They're not dying. They're getting past their hungers. It's the music that makes them pure like angels. Listen, when I was a young man down south, we had a chaplain. Every day he would play music for us, old music, beautiful. At first we couldn't listen to it. We never heard nothing like it. Sometimes the song would last a long time, no words. But then we started to love it. We would listen, like in the picture, and would remember things and would cry. And sometimes you could hear ten men cry, and sometimes the priest would cry too. We were all together in it, but then he retired and a new chaplain came. He was different. He wanted us to see doctors and counselors, the caseworkers. They would ask us questions about ourselves and make us go to classes, to programs. They were working on us, and the music ended. It was different. It was them against us. Thank you. Well, thank you, Nick, uh, Mr. Ellis, for an especially sensitive and illuminating account of the psychology of one criminal. Uh, no doubt, Raskolnikov's highly articulate introspection is atypical of criminal misbehavior of criminals, but I think there's one thing that strikes me as, as very likely to be typical of criminal activity, not only as a matter of psychology or the psychology of the criminal, but also as we try to grasp the nature of the harm of the criminal act itself. Namely, this typical thing is, I think, the um, extravagant use of freedom. It's characteristic of a criminal act, the way in which the criminal act reflects and, and really embodies and is just a, a sort of egocentric assertion of self and of one's will over against the wills and the well-being of other people. I think that's probably quite at the heart of even a philosophical appropriation of what crime is about. Now, Chester Burke is going to draw our attention to the theme of justice in Dostoevsky's The Brothers Karamazov. The last book of Dostoevsky's The Brothers Karamazov is entitled A Judicial Error because Dmitry Karamazov, the eldest Karamazov brother, is incorrectly found guilty of murdering his father, Fyodor. 
Nearly all the spectators in the packed courtroom are stunned by the verdict, despite the fact that most of them had assumed that Dmitri had indeed committed the murder. Only his brother Alyosha, his recently turned lover Grushenka, and his other brother Ivan are certain of Dmitri's evidence. Alyosha because of the innocence on Dmitri's face, Grushenka because, quote, Dmitri isn't the sort of man who would lie, and Ivan, despite loathing Dmitri, who visited Fyodor's illegitimate son, Smeryakov, the night before the trial, and forces him to confess to the murder. Later that night, Smeryakov commits suicide. Ivan's testimony becomes worthless. When suffering from brain fever, fever, he goes mad on the witness stand, claiming that the only witness to this stunning revelation is the devil. The first chapter of this final book is entitled, The Fatal Day. In the previous chapter, in the last paragraph, Alyosha says to himself, Yes, with Smerdyakov dead, no one will believe Ivan's testimony, but he will go and testify. God will win. Having heard these three powerful words, God will win, the reader is thrown into the human drama, that is, the trial. How can the truth emerge from such a gigantic public spectacle in which every one of the participants is entered with his private opinions and passions? Dostoevsky characterizes the spectators, quote, standing in a closely packed lump, shoulder to shoulder, as having been shaken to an intense degree of burning with impatience. The women favor Dmitri's acquittal, and the men, many of whom have been personally insulted by Dmitri, wish to see him punished. The prosecutor, Hippolyte Kirill Kirillovich, trembles at having to go against a famous Petersburg defense attorney in whose shadow he feels to have lived since their younger days in, Saint in Petersburg. He feels that everything is at stake in the trial, both for himself and for Russia. Fetyukovich, the famous defense attorney, exudes an air of confidence. But the reader may feel a little uneasy when Dostoevsky describes his eyes as small and inexpressive. His physiognomy had something sharply bird-like about it, which was striking. The prosecutor, known for and sometimes laughed at for his passion for psychology, puts together an account which seems to make sense of all of the facts. Even though the defense attorney, having digested the situation with astonishing rapidity, is able to discredit most of the witnesses. The reader takes delight here because he has previously, previous knowledge of these witnesses and the ugliness of their souls. The prosecutor tells a compelling story of Dmitri, quote, completing a poem, that's by murdering, by the way, which culminates in the murder of his father, the stealing of 3,000 rubles, and running off madly to find his lover, Grushenka. The defense attorney then accuses the prosecutor of writing his own novel of being a psychological poet whose psychology is too pronged and therefore capable of proving a given statement and its opposite. He masterfully shows that only the totality of the facts and not a single one of them in isolation speak against his client. Though he claims to demonstrate the limitations of psychology, the defense attorney is in fact a far better psychologist than the prosecutor. He argues persuasively that there was no money, no robbery, and no murder, at least by Dmitri. Only the reader has the privilege of having witnessed Dmitri, filled with loathing in front of his hateful father, pulling out a brass pestle from his pocket, and then not using it. Why didn't he kill him? Quote, God was watching over me then, Dmitri used to say afterwards. This is yet another reference to a divine arena that seems to have no point of entry into a court of justice. Due to Fetyukovich's skill in destroying each part of the whole accusation, there is, however, a reasonable chance that Dmitri will either be released or, at worst, given a minimal punishment. But then, in a chapter entitled A Southern Catastrophe, A Sudden Catastrophe, Dmitri's spurned lover Katya, ready to sacrifice her honor for his brother Ivan, comes forward with a letter from Dmitri, which she has been holding back, presumably to save him, despite the fact that he has stolen 3,000 rubles from her, the entirety of which she thinks he has spent in a single drunken night with her rival Grushenka. In this letter written just two days before the murder, Dmitri says he will get hold of the money he has stolen from her, even if he has to rob and kill his father to do so. The reader knows that Katya asked Dmitri to send these 3,000 rubles to a relative in Moscow, knowing at the time he would indeed spend them on her hated rival. Two other facts should be revealed. Before the events of the novel, Dmitri let, lent Katya 5,000 rubles to cover up a financial indiscretion committed by her father, and Dmitri, who in fact never stole the 3,000 rubles from his father, only spent half of the 3,000 rubles during the first wild night with Grushenka. It's only natural that you should be confused by the intricate adding and subtracting of monetary sums. 
Dostoevsky, always in need of money himself, masterfully uses sums of money to show how human beings struggle to regulate equality, honor, pride, and justice amongst themselves. But back to the letter. This suddenly revealed document, an apparent blueprint of the murder, gives mathematical certainty to the prosecutor's case. And though the words mathematical certainty are a clear signal to readers of Dostoevsky that whatever is certain in this way is not certainly true, it is equally certain that a jury will be very unlikely to yield a verdict of not guilty in face of such evidence. Aware of the difficulty of achieving a verdict of not guilty, and despite having just produced his own demonstration that there was no money, robbery, or murder, Fetiukovich, whose name in Russian suggests the words jerk, drip, or sourpuss, addresses the jury changing his tone and method. I have it in my heart to speak out something more to you. I, for I also sense a great struggle in your hearts and mind. Forgive my speaking to your hearts and minds, gentlemen, but I want to be truthful and sincere to the end. I do not renounce one iota of what I have just said, but suppose I did agree with the prosecution that my unfortunate client stained his hands with his father's blood. End of quote. This begins the second part of the defense attorney's summary to the journey, jury. Dostoevsky entitles this chapter, An Adulterer of Thought never directly commenting on or interpreting this astonishing title. Since the corpse of a father is the only fact in the case that could speak against his client, Fetiukovich tries to show that Fyodor was not at all a father. He masterfully summarized the most poignant scenes in the novel in order to paint Fyodor in the, most, in the worst possible way and to show why it would have been completely natural for Dmitri to have beaten and killed his father with a fatal pestle, which the reader knows was not even the real murder weapon, neither killing through premeditation or even wishing to kill. Such a murder is not a murder, he says. Such a murder is not parricide either. Such a murder can be considered parricide only out of prejudice. The attorney then inserts a quote from the gospel according to Matthew comparing Dimitri's plight to that of Christ. The most terrible punishment, but the only one by which Dimitri's soul will be saved would be for the jury to overwhelm him with mercy. The adultery lies in the fact that Fetiukovich is fabricating a dangerous novel, novel upon novel, shouts the prosecutor, a lie that's all the more so profound one because it's a false image of Father Zosima's teaching and more important what Dostoevsky has spent his whole life attempting to articulate. Only the prosecutor, breathless, inarticulate, confused, shaking with emotion, has the courage to respond. And of course his response will receive no sympathy from the mass of spectators especially the mothers and the fathers, who have amazingly enough become enraptured, enraptured by the words of the adulterer. Though the prosecutor is vain and beaten down by a failed life, though his superficial psychology prevents him from understanding the motives of actions of a human being, he knows with certainty that one cannot kill and not kill at the same time, that one cannot praise and immortalize a man who murders his father, and that a false image of Christ and religion have been fabricated by his talented competitor. The reader is irrit easily irritated by this pathetic man's just response, the prosecutor will himself die soon after the trial, to a powerful and dangerous speech that is arguing for a new understanding of human justice, one that includes a notion of mercy which could only be found in God or in the heart of an individual human being. I have pointed out that Dimitri, the prosecutor, and the defense attorney have all been accused of acting out novels. By his subtle but powerful use of chapter titles, the novelist himself takes the harshest stance towards the defense attorney. The Russian word for adulterer or fornicator is a variation of the word for lover. Uh, Fetiukovich, who claims to be able to feel invisible threads that bind the defense attorney and the jury together, whom everyone, including himself, expects to pull off some kind of miracle by proving Dmitri innocent when he is guilty, ends up by proving Dmitri guilty when in truth he is, is, is innocent. His call to regenerate not only Dmitri but also Russia herself is met with rapture and enthusiastic weeping among the spectators, among whom in all likelihood is the reader. When he pleads with the jury to show mercy to Dmitri, even if he did kill his father, he shows himself not to be a seeker of truth but to be unjust. In short, to be an adulterer of thought. I say unjust because he portrays Christ in a manner that resembles more an enlightened and compassionate liberal than the Son of God who died in order to save human beings from the power of sin. We can t detest the father, Theodor, in the depths of our souls. We can pity the children that he brought into the world. We can wish that he were dead and wonder why such a man is alive. But we cannot excuse the man who killed him. That man, Smerdyakov, hangs himself from a nail on his wall with a brief note saying that he alone is responsible for his own death. 
This extreme version of isolation is what Dostoevsky sees as the dreadful future of a world that denies God. Instead of hanging an icon or image of God on the wall, we will end up destroying ourselves. Dostoevsky, the novelist committed to real justice and truth, cannot allow the jury to be won over by this adultery of thought, even though it results as a momentary injustice in a court of law. By entitling the next chapter, Our Peasants Stood Up for Themselves, he shows that he is pleased that the peasants who comprise half of the jury are not seduced by this highest and, most, and ultimately most dangerous form of seduction. Though their verdict was incorrect, the peasants understood a deeper truth and rightly stood up for it. Their hearts rejected false novels. But the real novel ends several months later after Dmitri receives his sentence. It ends with a burial of a 10-year-old schoolboy, Ilyusha. Dmitri had gravely insulted Lucia's father, a retired and drunken officer known as the captain, by dragging him out of a tavern across town, pulling him by his wispy beard. Desperate to provide for his family, the captain was employed by Fyodor, assisting him in his shady financial dealings, one of which was to buy up Dmitri's promissory notes so as to bring him to financial disgrace. Seeing his father publicly humiliated, the young Ilusha begged Dmitri to forgive his father. When Ilusha's schoolmates heard about the incident, they teased him mercilessly. The next day, he angrily threw stones at them, but he himself received a great blow in the chest. He came down with a fever and died two days after Dmitri was sentenced for a murder he did not commit. Given Dostoevsky's masterful juxtaposition of scenes and events, it would be easy to connect Dmitri's punishment with the death of this young boy. As the proud and angry Katya says to Alyosha, Dmitri committed a rash and unjust act, a very ugly act. She commissions Alyosha to give a large sum of money to the captain in recompense for this act. The attempt at justice does not work at first. The captain initially takes the money, imagining a way out of abject poverty for himself and his miserable family, and then shaking with tears, flings down the money at Alyosha's feet. He will eventually take not only this money, but much more from the generous, though proud Katya, but his son will nevertheless die, and the doctors will not be able to cure his family. It was not unlikely that the pre previously consumptive Ilushka would have had only a short life, but that's not the point. All of us are continually doing harm to our fellow human beings. While it does not seem possible that any system of justice could regulate the damages we human beings are always trafficking amongst ourselves, exchanging goods and money in an attempt to achieve some kind of fairness, quote, each of us is guilty in everything before everyone, and I most of all. This puzzling sentence lying powerfully in the background of the novel is spoken by the elder Father Zosimo as a part of a conversation in the monastery on the last day of his life. I have tried to show that Fetiukovich's version is a dangerous adulteration of this claim. Dmitri, Ivan, Smirnyakov, and even Alyosha can be held responsible for the death of their father. Yet only one human being killed Fyodor, and it's the responsibility of the legal system to find and punish that human being. Dmitri had previously thrown his father to the floor and brutally kicked him, suspecting that Fyodor was hiding Grushenka from him. Though drunk, he had written the damn letter. Ivan had tacitly given Smerdyakov permission to kill Fyodor by leaving town, and worse, had spent most of the night of his departure listening for sounds in the house, unconsciously anticipating and desiring that someone would come and kill his dreadful father. Even Alyosha, distracted by the death of his hero Zosima, and overwhelmed with grief by the dishonor of the elder's rotting corpse, had forgotten to keep in touch with Dmitri. But Smerdyakov, having spent his entire life in servitude to a family, all of whom he despised except Ivan, uh, uh, <clears throat> yeah, whose respect he desperately thirsted for, understood the characters of these Karamazovs, at least their baser sides, he was able to set up a scenario in which it would be possible for him to kill Fyodor, who trusted him alone. Uh, and only Ivan, possessing a conscience whose depth was unknown to himself, hating both his father and his brother, could get Smerdyakov to confess. And this was only possible because Smerdyakov, beaten down his whole life, had finally given up on life when he saw the emptiness and dishonesty of Ivan's thoughts, though not his heart. Smerdyakov, far wiser and cleverer than even the most observant reader could suspect, seeing that Ivan was more like his father, Fyodor, than either of the other brothers. The chain of responsibility is endless. Grushenka says in court that it all happened because of me. Just after that, Katerina, who tried to charm her out of loving Dmitri, says she's the cause of everything. And at the same time, after Dmitri's arrest, Grushenka, hearing that Dmitri had supposedly killed his father, cries that she is guilty of it all. 
but everyone gets the problem of justice wrong, precisely because it's impossible to see clearly into the heart of another human being. Zosima immediately understands the danger looming before the Karamazov family in the first chapters of the novel. That is why he bows before Dmitri and encourages Alyosha to look after him. But Zosima cannot control the outcome stemming from human nature. He can only preach active love, a difficult and profound notion worthy of another talk, and he can pray. While I do not claim that the following is a solution to the problem of human justice, I'd like to end this talk with a quotation from Father Zosima. Quote, if it were not for Christ's church, indeed there would be no restraint on the criminal in his evil doing and no punishment for it later, real punishment that is not a mechanical one such as just been mentioned, which only chafes the heart. You know, that verb is just, I think, amazing, which only chafes the heart. That, that's what it boils down to, according to Zosima, in most cases, but a real punishment which lies in the acknowledgement of one's own conscience. Thank you. Well, thank you, Chester Burke, and thank you all three speakers for what I think turned out to be um, three um, wonderful talks, but also mutually illuminating talks. So the hour for the appointed end of this session draws near, but I do think we have some time before lunch is served. So I'll presume upon the speakers to remain for a little while and take a few questions. Yes, sir, in the back. Dan Mann in the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals. So thanks for the wonderful talk to all three speakers. Questions for both Mr. Burke and Mr. Mistrellis. Just kind of hit on what Father Zosima said that the human justice system can only shape the heart. It's the higher justice system that really drives home redemption and can bring you to redemption or damnation, depending on which way you want to go. Do you think human justice can ever bring about redemption? At least in Dostoevsky's view. You can, uh, why don't you try to project your voice as best you can so we don't get up and down too much. All right, Nick, if you don't mind. It, it'll be impossible. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, this is so high. I don't think Dostoevsky, uh, frankly, in the, there's a moment in the Brothers Karamazov where it looks like he wants to replace the criminal justice system. It's that initial uh, talk of uh, Father Zosima. Uh, about replacing um, civil courts with ecclesiastical courts, but I, there's no reason to think that's really Dostoevsky's opinion. I, I don't think there's any sense of replacing the normal criminal justice system with another one. I think he's saying whatever you might think of punishment as retribution, it by itself is not going to alter the soul of the criminal. It may do another social good, like keeping dangerous people locked up, all sorts of things. And it may even end up being an occasion for a greater thing to happen, as happened in the case of Ross Holmenbach. But it's not going to be retribution that uh, heals a criminal, because he already, somewhere in his soul, knows that he's guilty. But until that becomes present to him, everything else is going to look like violence. That's, uh, I don't know, just for something. Jester and Chris, this question. Well, just to use that question as a springboard for saying something provocative, a, a pure utilitarian um, doesn't believe society should be involved at all in retribution. Humans cannot figure out whether someone is really culpable or not. That's God's job, not society's. And that's why they reject retributivism as the bottom line consideration for justice. Instead, should go toward a more crime preventive approach. Well, one could say that there's a kind of justice that depends upon seeing into one's heart. That's a higher form, and that form will be present in the kingdom. But that's not exclusive. That's not incompatible with saying there's a, there's a kind of justice obtainable under the conditions under, in which we labor. But they may be two different forms, or one's a higher synthesis of the other. Additional questions? Yes, sir. Yes. Uh, Brian Ashton, UAB. Um, one question for Chris, and one about. Um, Brothers Karma also. Um, for Chris, I wonder about this uh, idea of the empiric desert, um, the problem of mitigating a diversity of ideas, uh, I mean, kind of this deliberative democracy approach. Well, don't we have a deliberative democ democracy that is called a representative government and election and having um, that, that, that in some ways is a mitigating mechanism to deal with the diversity? It the very, very good point. And certainly a criticism of Robinson has been 
Why are we going around polling the general public when we have legislators to presumably represent the general public and tell us what the public thinks about justice? His response to that is, we can't trust legislators. They are reacting to all sorts of things other than justice. They're, they're reacting to public output over a single event. They're worried about getting reelected. They're not really thinking about justice. They're thinking about other things. And therefore, they can't be trusted to come up with the right approaches. That, that's one of his responses. There are others as well. Brothers K question? Yeah, um, if I remember correctly, it's been a while. Um, in one of the chapters where Ivan goes on and on and on and on, um, uh, he brings up a story uh, that uh, where they're continue, continuing kind of a, the Calvinist influence of a repentant sinner, um, kind of this French influence of um, where there, there was there was a man who committed a crime, then repents, and but he's put to death, and he makes fun of uh, you know that they put him to death even though he was a, he completely repented. It seems to give criticism that, uh, but there's a tension there. Um, it's not clear what the character um, thinks about that circumstance, whether mercy should have been given because he repented, right. or yes. whether that was appropriate justice. And I don't know if that, what Dostoevsky's view of that scenario was. If I right, remember. so uh, that's a conversation between Ivan and his brother Alyosha. They've been trying to have this conversation for a long time, and because one of them believes in God, the other doesn't. I mean, that would be the way to say why there's a separation, but they run into each other. And, and uh, I was just listening story after story, which is back from the newspapers, and so those kids who got his story, uh, uh, the things that are, that are guaranteed to make your heart chill. Like, there's a guy, uh, who's, I'm thinking, who's brought up uh, uh, kind of in, in nature and did some bad thing, but he repented for it, but he was getting his just desserts, he was going to be killed. Uh, and uh, somehow the we should be happy that he was going to meet his maker in heaven and things like that. So the way it's told, you can't help but say, this is wrong, right? That there's something really wrong here, that, that, that somehow, in this case, uh, uh, the system of justice and, and, and the, the religious people who are, who are saying, okay, don't worry about it, you're going to die. So it's, it's, I think it's very multi-level because if you're really reading Dostoevsky, you realize that Ivan is just looking for those kinds of things. Uh, he's looking for things to show why, you know, why there is no God. Because if there were, a, if there were a God, how could there be these kinds of things? Or even worse, Ivan would say, "I do believe in God, but I don't accept His plan. I just want to turn in my ticket." And at some point, he forces Alyosha to say, "You know, with another one, this is horrible. Shouldn't we really be mad at these people? Don't you really want to get me?" Alyosha says, "Yes," because he, he thinks he's trapped Alyosha. So, to answer your question, I think that. What Dostoevsky is saying there is that from both sides, the religious side, um, hey, the Pope, by the way. <laughs> so he, it might be an interesting question, what's the difference between the Pope and these elders that he seems to love so much? But from both sides, the kind of the, the legal side and the religious side, they're, they're dangerous pitfalls. You know? um, so that, that, that's how I start to answer your question. So basically, every one of those little scenes has to be taken in context who's saying it and uh, but they're all, they all get to the heart. And they have a strong reaction to it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. The question is for Nick. Uh, I was wondering whether, can you hear me? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, whether it would be possible to say that had Raskolnikov concluded that in a, in a different situation, the murder would have been a Napoleonic murder with a high end then it would have been justified. Who, who would have said that Dostoevsky? Raskolnikov, Raskolnikov? Or, Do, or Dostoevsky. Yeah, uh, I, think, um, I think Raskolnikov tries very, very hard to say that. I think that the way uh, Dostoevsky structures the narrative, he never allows Raskolnikov to say that wholeheartedly. Every time Raskolnikov says it, something comes up so that he says the opposite which makes it clear that this is, uh, I don't want to go too far afield, but if you know the picture of the divided soul in Paul's epistle to the Romans, this is the thing itself. That every time he says one thing, the other thing pops up as if he had no control over it. So from the point of view of Raskolnikov, he wants very much to be Napoleon, and he hates himself initially because he isn't. Dostoevsky, I think, has no doubt that this, that Napoleon is a monster, I think. That he's, he's a monstrosity, 
and there is not one good thing to be said for him. That's the way we feel.